are in a sermon series that we have entitled Deconstructing, and uh, it's really inspired by, I don't think it's really new necessarily, but it has become with the advent like social media and um, different types of outlets that are so readily available to us now. You know, it's, it's been an, an exposure and even almost becoming, I guess I don't want to use the word a fad, but definitely being perpetuated by social media. This idea of folks who are taking key core doctrines of the Christian faith and pulling it apart. Um, some folks, many folks who are doing this are actually maybe born and raised in the church. And some of them are deconstructing or pulling it apart to the point where they are walking away from Jesus, walking away from the scriptures. And so um, in the last couple of weeks, we have been dealing with subjects that I would consider to be maybe more doctrinal and then some cultural, you know. And so uh, last week we talked about spiritual abuse and we talked about toxic church and if you're anything like me, after service, Jamila and I are driving home, like still processing what the heck went on. I mean, even as the person who's preaching and reading through it, we're still trying to figure things out, you know. And um, and I know I've spoke to many of you who went home. There was more than a few people, and some of you are going to laugh. Like, that was me. I want you to know there was more than a few people that said something like, I just wanted to go home and curl up in a ball for a little bit. And, um, and so that, that was seemed to be like a, a something that folks were saying. And so, um, so uh, yes, that was kind of more of a cultural kind of more. Today, we're going to go doc, talk, talk about doctrine. And so I just want you to congratulate yourself because you made it here today. And we're going to talk about hell. And, um, and so um, congratulations for that. Um, you made it on the hell day. We're going to go to hell, I guess. Yeah, I guess you could say. Um, we're not going to go to hell, but uh, definitely we're going to talk about hell. And if you've been with Inspired Church for several years, you know that you, sometimes in the summer uh, we would do what we call theology and coffee, where we would gather on a midweek in circles with coffee and discuss doctrines and theological um, concepts and ideas. So this is going to kind of feel like maybe less of a sermon. I'm, sur I'm sure I'll sneak a preach in here somewhere, uh, but there's going to be a lot of learning. Uh, for those of you that love to learn, I mean, I guess you all love to learn, but for those of you that like to put yourself in a place of a student, you might eat this up. For those of you that are like, ugh, I got rid of that. I left that behind. Um, I hope that you're still able to engage. I'll try to make it as, uh, uh, as um, relevant as possible so I don't lose you. Uh, but today, uh, we're going to talk about hell. And uh, my, <laughs> my wife sometimes will, I'll sit down and just kind of dialogue. She really last week kind of helped me walk through the message. And this week I was kind of sharing some concepts and ideas. And she's like, wait, 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 can you, uh, can you just like warn them? So like my wife is always like the sensitive, like I'm like, man, let's rush right into it and pull the bandaid off. And so, you know, I do, for those of you that maybe think you know what hell is like, um, suspend that for a minute. Um, and so I might challenge some of your preconceived notions of hell. And you might be tempted to label me a heretic, <laughs> but just like stay with me through this process. And, um, and I, I, I believe you'll see kind of what maybe the, what maybe, but what I believe the scripture is trying to say. Amen. Okay. That was a long introduction and that wasn't even an introduction. So, um, here we go. Uh, one of the most difficult subjects to discuss in all of Christianity is the doctrine of hell. In fact, I think I told this story several months ago. Uh, I had uh, lunch with a high school friend of mine who knows I'm a pastor. And, uh, you know, we had a great day catching up with life and discussing all kinds of things. And as we sat down for lunch, she goes, okay, okay I got a quick question. And I was like, yeah. And then she preferenced with, I am the most liberal person you'll ever meet, Pastor Phil. Like all of a sudden she started to call me Pastor Phil, right? We've been friends our whole lives. So I'm like, okay, so at some point... You know, I put that pastor out on. She was, I'm the most liberal person you'll ever see. Like I am, you know, she just started to label off her credentials for being someone we would consider to be very secular. Um, and she's like, so am I going to hell? That was her question. And, uh, and, uh, and so uh, what's really interesting for a lot of folks is that God is synonymous with hell. 
whether it's somebody who's been born and raised in church and has a wrong idea of hell or somebody maybe who, who, has, uh, 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 who hasn't been in church but just automatically assumes, you know, God and hell and judgment and all of that stuff is kind of lumped under this like really bad space or bad place. And, um, and so what I want to do today is I want to ask you, when, when I say hell, what comes to mind? Like, what do you think about when I say the word hell? If I asked you to describe hell, you know, how would you describe it? Um, there might be different ways that some of you describe. Oh, I hear the whispers. I want to hear what those whispers are. Uh, <laughs> maybe I don't. Uh, but, you know, there, there are a lot of different, different things, images that might bombard your heart. Uh, might bombard your mind as you think about hell. For example, uh, one of the first images that might bombard your heart as you think about hell is that provided by South Park. Um, now, now I got to be honest, don't look too closely at these images because there might be something inappropriate, but we're in the Crown Plaza, you know what I mean? So like I... But I, my point is, is um, what, you know, maybe for you, hell is like mythological. And to be honest, like if you were honest, it's primitive for you. Maybe it's something that you think the religious establishment has created to control the masses. And so as a result, maybe hell is something you make light of or, or, or you poke fun of. Very much a possibility. Or... Maybe for some of you, maybe you've been to places or you've experienced firsthand this next photo or something close to it, unimaginable suffering. Like maybe you've been there, maybe you've seen it, or you yourself have experienced some kind of unimaginable, experience, uh, unimaginable suffering, and you've concluded that hell isn't a place that some people go to when they die, but that hell is a literal place on earth. Or maybe for others in this room, which I would wager might be the overwhelming majority of those, when I said hell, some of the things that you thought of, uh, maybe it's something more like uh, this. Um, this is a painting called The Last Judgment uh, by Michelangelo. And this painting covers uh, a, a wall of the altar in the Sistine Chapel in Vatican City. Now, this painting has several different elements to it. Um, it's describing the last judgment. You're going to see some positive elements, and then you're going to see some more negative elements. Um, but in some parts of this painting, if we were to kind of zoom in, you know, you might see somebody who is being skinned alive. Uh, you'll see some folks being drug, dragged, drug, dragged by like demonic figures into pits. Um, you, you know, and maybe not this particular picture, but there are other famous pictures or portraits that are out there. That may suggest, you know, pitchforks and Satan himself and his demons endlessly, eternally torturing and tormenting or, you know, you know, your eyes getting poked out and, then, you know, and then it grows back and gets poked out again, like for eternity, right? Because you had like a lust problem. Um, and so whether it's, and we'll keep this up here for a second, whether it's famous artwork in religious settings, right? Or it's testimonies. Y'all know what I'm talking about. On TBN. Okay, some of you guys don't even know what TBN is. TikTok. <laughs> there, there, there you go, right? Maybe it's testimonies of folks claiming, right, to have gone to hell. Some of you eat that up. <laughs> uh, most people, including a lot of Christians, and maybe in this room, get their ideas of hell, not from the Bible, but from Greek mythology, from medieval European culture, you know, from, from and this image and a lot of these images that you see kind of like this are inspired from, from Dante's Inferno, this idea of hell, a poem of hell written by Dante, but not necessarily from the actual Bible. 
On a total side note, anybody ever watch the movie Ghost? <laughs> Might be dating myself. <laughs> Uh, you know, I just thought that was the scariest rendition of hell. Like, I don't know if you know that, but it's about this guy who dies, and when people die, like these really shadowy figures come in, like, they drag you. Anyway, total side note. Um, now, like, when you see ghouls and goblins and demon, demonic figures and devils consuming, filleting skin, dragging naked people down to pits, um, if that's your understanding of hell, or if that's what some people have been raised to think hell is, you can already begin to see why some folks would begin to question a God who would allow that place to exist. It's pretty barbaric, right? Like it's pretty evil, <laughs> right? Like it's pretty like your worst nightmare type of, you know, God of your nightmares. And so here's kind of my my, my, my mission today, okay? My mission is twofold. Well, I have a mission and then I have a prayer. My mission is to, clar- to do my best to clarify the truth of hell, um, to expose the truth of hell as depicted in the scriptures. Yeah. Yeah. You hear me? Not like South Park or, or, or not, you know, Michelangelo, Leonardo, or Donatello, but as depicted in the scriptures, and, and, and so that's my, my mission today. Um, my prayer is that once you see what hell actually is in the scriptures, and this may sound a little counterintuitive, that that truth will lead you to have more, to strengthen your confidence in the goodness of God. Now you might say like, most people walk away from God because they would ask themselves, how could a good God allow there to be a place called hell but my hope is that the truth of the scriptures would actually instead of kind of eating away at your confidence in the goodness of God because I mean can we be honest in here as believers there are little things that we're kind of afraid to think about about God because if we begin to kind of bring that thing up and start to work it out we actually might not like y'all with me and hell's one of those places and so that's my hope and that's my prayer As we walk through this very unconventional conversation on a Sunday morning here at Inspire, as Pastor Roger said a couple of weeks ago, if you're new here, welcome. Uh, uh, But we are definitely um, a church that wants to, in love, in grace, and truth, dialogue and have conversations with even the most difficult subjects. And we've done it in the past and we'll continue to do it here in love. Um, And at the end of the day, our hope is that we would be a church of grace and truth. Amen? that we wouldn't just use truth to hammer people in the head, um, but that we would also not be so permissive um, and, and, and allow anything that we're actually not really following the king and his kingdom. Amen? So let's pray, and then we'll jump in. Heavenly Father, I pray for your grace, your mercy, and your truth. I pray for people who are in this room, hearts and minds, who have their preconceived understanding of who you are, uh, what hell is. Um, Lord, I just pray that somewhere in these words, Holy Spirit, that you would illuminate the text and that you would speak to every heart in this room so that everyone could leave this place and say they heard from the Lord, they got something from the Lord, um, and that they're going to take that with them and allow the Holy Spirit to just move and build in their lives. And so, um, of course, we we give you all honor and glory because you are worthy of it all. Um, And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to try to just present to you uh, uh, some ideas, some some thoughts, um, and kind of three big ideas that will kind of shape our time together. Uh, The first thing that I want to do, that I'm going to do, is I want to put hell in its place, okay? We're going to put hell in its proper place. And, and what we're going to do secondly, after we're done putting hell in its proper place, um, and, uh, we are also going to then look at the words of Jesus. What, how, how did Jesus view hell? We're going to interpret maybe some of his more common phrases. This isn't going to be a, we're not going to be able to cover everything, um, but I'm going to do my best just to give you a high view of this today, okay? 
Um, and then finally, once we've kind of put hell in its place biblically, and we've talked a little bit about how Jesus talks about hell, we're going to end with kind of these, what I would consider to be maybe the four main views of hell, four ways people see hell, four main views of hell. And, and then we're going to glorify Jesus together, and we're going to leave, and we're going to eat, and it's going to be a great Sunday. Amen? Amen. 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 So let's, let's put hell in its place. And I want to make sure I honor some resources that were kind of really helpful uh, in me putting together this sermon. In fact, I'm going to, throughout, throughout today, I'm really going to lean heavy on a particular author and theologian, and his name is Joshua Ryan Butler. And if you are interested in any of the resources, I'm always wanting to share with you. But his name is Joshua Ryan Butler, and he wrote a book called The Skeletons in God's Closet. And now when you hear that, if you're like really like, you know, that really is offensive because God doesn't have any skeletons, you're right, he doesn't. But uh, what he writes about are some of the elements in the text and the scripture that we tend to suppress because we don't want to talk about those things. And he really tries to bring them up in order to see God's goodness. And, um, and so as I was kind of studying and resourcing or whatnot, this was, he was such a, such a big inspiration. And, um, and so I definitely want to recommend that to you as well. Amen? Amen. So... In order to understand hell, and again, we're putting hell in its proper place. In order to understand hell, I think we really need to go back to the grand story of the Bible. And that's what we started with, right? We, throughout this entire year, we've, we've had a, a motto or a theme, a rally cry, if you will, right? We, we said, tell the story, know the story to tell the story, right? And so when we say tell the story, we say tell the story of God. Tell his story about his love for his creation. Like tell the story of scripture. And if you've been with us for any amount of time, you know that we've been able to take this big Bible of yours, right, full of stories, and we've been able to compartmentalize it into four chapters. Like if you were to think, well, what is the story of the Bible? What is the story of salvation, right? We would essentially say like this, like chapter one of the story is creation. Chapter two of the story is fall. Chapter three of the story is redemption. And then chapter four is consummation. Okay? And those would be the four chapters. Like if you were to take all of God's plan for history, salvation history, and compartmentalize it in four chapters, creation, fall, redemption, consummation. Are you with me? Yeah. So I think it's important. A lot of us, we need to take hell and we need to understand how it fits in the context of God's grand story. Amen? Like if, if we're going to understand hell, we need to understand it in the context of the story. So, so let's look at each chapter and just kind of see how hell or where hell would fit in into the context of the story. And so like we said, chapter one is creation. We find that in Genesis one and Genesis two. And what do we learn? That in the beginning, God created. He created the heavens and he created the earth. He created the stars, the moon, the sky, the waters, the animals. He created it all. And if you remember throughout Genesis one and two, and we talked about this back in September, whenever God created, he declared what he created what? good. And at the very end of it all, he said it was very good. And so chapter one is in the beginning, God created everything very good. And here's what I want you to see. What was God's ultimate desire? What was God's ultimate goal for creating everything? God's desire was to see heaven unified with earth. In fact, this is what the garden of Eden modeled. Do you know that? The Garden of Eden, like we were never meant to build physical temples. We were never meant to build temples with bricks and stone and mortar. The Garden of Eden was a temple. I mean, if you think about a temple, a temple is a place where man goes to meet with God. Right? And so the Garden of Eden, when it was created, was a sacred space. For man and God to dwell together. It was heaven on earth, and that was God's intention. In fact, Adam was a kind of priest of this temple. Are you with me? Yeah. Now, here's what uh, 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 um, Joshua Ryan Butler will have to say that I really just kind of lash on. Notice, right, notice that hell is not heaven's counterpart. In fact, if you search the scriptures, you will never find like heaven and hell paired together. 
Now, you'll find hell and you'll find heaven all over it, but you'll never find them together. Now, you bring them together. I bring them together. Culture brings them together. Right? You know, almost, we almost think about it's the, it's the picture of, you know, the cartoon, right? the, the angel and the devil, right? There's heaven and hell are always kind of juxtaposed, kind of put together. Are you with me? But in the Bible, hell is not heaven's counterpart. So here, here's, here's what's number one really key. Remember, we want to put hell in its place. Amen? Yeah. Here's what's really key. The biblical storyline is not about heaven and hell. It's about heaven and earth. It's about heaven and earth. Hell only comes into view as man rejects God's rule in favor for himself. Are you with me? So we move from chapter one, creation, everything is very good, heaven and earth, to fall. What do we see in chapter three of Genesis? Humanity rebels against God, right? Like humanity says, no thank you to God's government. God speaks a word, a governing word, and Adam says, nah, I think I'm going to do what I want instead. Oh, you see that? And so God's word is rejected, and Adam decides to, for autonomous rule, self-rule. And that's the fall. Humanity rebels against God, and, and as a result, falls into sin, and sin ruins God's good creation, doesn't it? Don't we see that? Yeah. In his rejection of God, man opens the door to the power of hell. And, and Jamila and I were talking about that this week, right? Like hell is a place and a power, right? And so sin, death, destruction, decay, all these things that are starting to take place because of the rebelliousness of Adam, right? We see the power of hell. Are you with me? What does sin do? What does this power do? Well, it shatters peace. It shatters shalom. And in doing that, it destroys relationships, doesn't it? I mean, that's what we see in the text. We see that sin destroys our relationship with God. Sin destroys our relationship with each other. And sin destroys our relationship with ourselves. And so we see sin, we see the power of hell, shattering shalom, destroying relationships, and it corrupts creation. And like a wildfire, right, sin begins to burn. All God's good creation, everything in its path. How are we doing? Uh, and Joshua Ryan Butler, he puts it like this. Uh, he pictures sin, death, and hell as an intruder. And so we're going to put, if we're going to put hell in its place, are you ready? We're going to have to see that hell is an intruder wreaking havoc, invading creation and separating heaven and earth, right? So what God wants to bring together, sin separates. How y'all doing? So again, we're putting hell in its place. And so something, something has to stop this. Something has to stop this. God's good design, God's original intention now being invaded, corrupted, separated. Something has to be done. Or at least that's what the reader would think as they were reading this. And that's what you would all think as you go to the movies, a good plot line of any good story, right? Something good, something bad, something has to be done. That's our expectation. That's, that's something that's inside of the fabric of our heart, what makes a good story. And so we move to the third chapter of the scriptures, right? So we have creation, everything's good, fall, everything's bad, and then we have redemption. Redemption. And what is redemption? It's everything that God is doing to take what is wrong and make it right again. Are you okay with me? So God becomes a man, in redemption, he puts on flesh in Jesus, right? We see Jesus, who is the God-man. And what does God do? God puts on flesh, he becomes a man. Why does he do it? To redeem the world. From what? What does he buy to redeem the world? He buys the world, that's what redeem is. To redeem something is to buy it back, to take it back. And so Jesus puts on flesh, God puts on flesh, and he comes to redeem the world from what? From the powers of hell, sin, and death. I mean, isn't this the purpose of the cross? 
you look at Colossians, if you look at 2 Corinthians, in fact, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 18 and 20 tells us that the ministry of Jesus is reconciliation. Christ's ministry is a ministry of reconciliation. You know what reconciliation is? When you are breaking apart, to come back together is to be reconciled. And so the, on the cross, the blood of Jesus takes what's been broken apart and brings it back together. He brings together what sin and hell have separated. He brings together what sin and hell have torn apart by reconciling us back to God. We could say, and this is going to be a third important component to putting hell in its place. We could say that God's mission is to get the hell out of earth. But not like you're thinking. <laughs> Right? Like God's mission is to take this invader, this intruder. Are you with me? And, and to get it out, to deal with it. And, and, and that includes not just the hell outside of us, but the hell in us. <laughs> God's mission is to get the hell out of earth in order to reunite, reconcile heaven and earth again. It's not my words, by the way. Are y'all with me? Yeah. How you doing? Good. We're so quiet. <laughs> we got a quiet church. So here's what we're going to do. Remember, remember the chapters. Chapter one, creation. Everything is very good. Heaven and earth. Chapter two, fall. Man rebels. Man sins. Man chooses self-rule over the rule of God. And what is the result of you making your own decisions? You fall. <laughs> you fail. And sin comes in and the power of hell comes in. All of a sudden it starts to what? Wreak havoc and bring separation. Separates us from God. Separates us from his good design. Amen? And so after fall we see redemption. God has to do something about that. So he comes in the form of of his son, Jesus Christ. How y'all doing? And Christ on that cross redeems the world through his blood. He brings back together what has been torn apart. He's dealing with sin. He's dealing with hell. He's dealing with death. All the elements that are attacking God's good design, he's dealing with it. And he's not just attacking the things on the outside, but also what? Inside. And so we get to the final chapter, which we have yet to see as consummation, right? Like we know Jesus has done this and we know that the kingdom we say is already and not yet. Yeah. Like we live in this tension in which the cross has triumphed and, 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 and the love of God and, and the forgiveness of God and the reconciliation of God is beginning to move across hearts and minds throughout the centuries. But we await a future day. A consummation, right? When that is complete and the kingdom of God is here on earth, right? And we see the, the uh, totality of that reconciliation. Are you with me? Like we long for that day. The gospel calls that the hope of glory. That one day there'll be no more sin. One day there'll be no sickness, death, decay, destruction, hell. The powers of hell will no longer be invading this earth. Are you with me? This is what consummation looks like, right? This is the ultimate hope of the gospel. This is what we long for. And you know, this is what, even if you're not a Christian, like let's say you're in this room and maybe you're an atheist, you still long for this. You just try to find other ways to do this, right? Yeah. You're just trying to find other ways to uh, elongate your life, right? Right? Like uh, maybe science will save Maybe technology will save. Like we all have gods. We are looking for a God to save us from a kind of hell and bring us a kind of heaven. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. And, and, and that's why you'll see nations war against each other, right? And, and whenever a nation goes to war, in order to get the buy-in of the population, they're going to describe a kind of hell and describe a kind of salvation. Are we Okay. So this is, this is the, you don't have to be a Christian to have this hope. This is the ultimate hope. We hope for a day when sin will be dealt with. 
We hope for a day when heaven and earth will be reunited. And we hope for a day when all things will be made new. Now listen, this is the part that's going to get tricky, and I need you to pay attention to this. This might, in some ways, to long for heaven is to long for hell. And let me, let me try to unpack that. If we desire for the creator to make all things right, we have to be prepared for that to include him dealing with all things that are wrong. Are you guys with me? Like if we desire, and I, Kat, you already said it, you're there. If we, no, no, you're good. <laughs> you're following me. If we desire to make all things right, that desire to make things right will also partner with the reality that the things that are wrong have to be dealt with. Are you with me? I love how he puts it, he puts it like this. Hoping for the dawning of new light means also hoping and longing for the banishment of darkness. Right? Like hoping for the body to be healed also comes for a hope that whatever's plaguing the body would be eradicated. Right? You can't hope for a body to be healed of a disease and not hope for that disease to be dealt with. So to make things new, God has to deal with hell. God has to deal with sin. God has to deal with the powers of hell. And he has to deal with the power of hell that is corporate, right, and systemic. Amen? Right? Genocide. War. Slavery. Human trafficking. Right? In order for a place to become heaven, you have to get that the hell out. That's not a cuss word, I promise. Well, actually, it might have been. I'm sorry. And my mom clapped, too, so I'm okay. <laughs> She's ready. She's like, that's what we'll use it right there. I'm kidding, Mom. I love you. Forgive me. I realized, yeah, that was kind of, anyway. But, th- but do you get what I'm saying? Like, it can't be heaven unless you drive that stuff out. Or, or can you have a heaven and trafficking existing simultaneously? But guess what? Systems, groups, right, are all created by individuals. Are you with me? And so there, there's not just the power of hell that's out there, but there's a power of hell that's in here. And all of us are guilty of that. Pride. Lust. Anger, rage, jealousy, envy, greed, competition, backbiting, gossiping. Are you with me? Like that's in me. That's in you. And so, so though, though we look at seeing oppressive systems and we look at uh, uh, oppressive uh, uh, ideologies, like we, we can't blame it on the system or the ideology. We also have to take a look at the people who create the system. See, we have two different types of people in this political I don't want circus in America. We have people who blame the individual and people who blame the system. And as they blame the system, they don't take any accountability for their own actions. But as they blame, but as they blame, the, as they blame the, uh, as they blame the individual, they, they try to deny that there's no systemic stuff. Wow. Are you with me? Yeah. Like, are we so polarized that we kind of go dumb to the reality that it's both end? Oh, wow. That's so good. Evil people create evil systems. Both exist. Okay, I got to get off my my soapbox because everyone's not going to like me i take pride in that and that's not a good thing that's pride can, can let, you're like i need some bible <laughs> look just listen to james good old james where's andy at let's just go to james <laughs> inside joke uh james chapter four verses one through three and i know you're expecting to be on there but i didn't put it on there i'm sorry listen to what it says what he says where do wars and fights come from <laughs> among you look what he says do they not come from your desires for pleasure 
that war in your members? He says, you lust and do not have. You murder and covet and cannot obtain. See what James is saying? Like, where do you get warfare from? Where does that come from? It comes from you. It comes from your desire. Uh, your desire for your country or your nation to be safe and secure. Yeah. Right? Because every nation, right, every empire, in order for it to, to be able to uh, uh, expand, in order for it to be able to conquer, right, there's always people that need to buy in. And, and we get play off that. And so if you long for heaven, if you long for a good God to make all things new, you also long for a God who's going to deal with everything that's wrong. You see how that has to go together logically? So let me ask you this. How can the truth of hell strengthen your confidence in the goodness of God? And again, not my words. This might have been, I know Tim Mackey has used it. I know uh, um, uh, um, Joshua Ryan Butler has used it. I've heard it. Hell is not a subterranean torture chamber. <laughs> Are you with me? I, that, that was funny to me. And, you know, I got one laugh. You have permission to laugh. Hell is not a subterranean torture chamber. And God is like a, not a divine, like, masochist who just enjoys sending people to hell. Like, yeah, you didn't obey me. <laughs> you know, I got, a, I got a special torture room just for you. Are you with me? And it's kind of fun, but that's what some of you have in mind. You know, if that's your God, I wouldn't want no part of that. Instead, here it is. Hell is a part of the biblical view of justice. From a loving God who desires to punish evil and make right again all things that have gone wrong. If we're putting hell in its place, we have to understand in the grand story. You can't just cherry pick it in order to justify your distance from God. Um, Timothy Keller citing a Croatian-born theologian, Merzlov Volf. I hope I got that wrong, right, Merzlov. Um, his work, he wrote, he wrote a book. He, wrote, he did a work called Exclusion and Embrace, and I just kind of want to share with you. Volf, who had experienced the Yugoslav Wars, and in these wars, he experienced the endless cycles of blood feuds. He, he said this, the cycle of retaliation is not fueled by the belief in a God of judgment, but is fueled by a lack of belief in a God of judgment. What do I mean by that? He, he, it's fascinating. Here's what he says. If God were not angry at injustice, God would not be worthy of worship. Wow. So here's his conclusion. Here's his conclusion. The practice of nonviolence requires a belief in divine vengeance. The practice of nonviolence, and anybody in this room who's ever been violated, anyone who's in this room who's someone who had power, hurt, or harmed you, you know, and we talked about this, you know the longing that you have for justice. And you know that when justice is not applied, how much it can hurt you, destroy you, eat you, and even cause you to sin, even though you were sinned against. Yeah. Am I right? Yeah. If you've talked to, and this is, this is both, if you've talked to people who have seen their homes burned, their families tortured, raped, and murdered, how are you going to keep them from picking up the sword and being sucked into cycles of violence and retaliation? What are you going to say to appease their broken hearts? He goes on to conclude the only resource he knows powerful enough to both pacify the, humans, the human heart's desire for justice. And at the same time, keep us from getting sucked into that cycle of blood and vengeance. is to say that there is a God. He is good and he intends to make everything right. Yeah. 
So Keller argues the existence of the doctrines of judgment in hell can actually empower us to live in peace in the world. Though we may have suffered terrible offenses against us. Because if God is asking us to forgive, are you with me? If God is asking us to apply grace, right, if God is asking us to look like him, right, on this earth, then, then what are we going to do with that longing for justice? We have to trust that God is what? Just. And how could someone be loving if they weren't just? Y'all doing okay? So now that we put hell in its place, I just want to take a few moments just to look at the words of Jesus, okay? I want to look at the words of Jesus. I want to interpret the words of Jesus, right? This, is, this might be a little shocking for some of you. Um, almost everything we know about hell comes from Jesus, right? So, so the man that most people are like, well, man, I don't know about the Bible, but we like Jesus, right? There are a lot of folks there that deconstruct, and they say, well, we're going to keep the loving Jesus who talks more about hell than any other person in the scripture. Y'all okay with that? Good. So this is why we take hell seriously, because Jesus took hell seriously. So what are some of the common ways that Jesus described hell? So, you know, right away, one way you might say is, well, hell. (laughs) Hell. He called this place hell. Hell. Where did that even come from, right? The, the, the Greek word here is Gehenna, is Gehenna. And I don't have time to go through all of the references, but if you want to take photos or if you'd like for me to send you these slides, they're always available, okay? You can go home and like a good brand, study it for yourself. Gehenna is a Greek word spelled, actually transliterated from a Hebrew word. Gehenna is an actual place. It's a real place. Uh, it, it's, it's the valley. It means the valley of Hinnom. The valley of Hinnom. And it's actually located just outside of Jerusalem. You could go to hell right now. You really could. In fact, I was going to throw a picture up there, but I thought I'd be doing too much. Now, here's what I want you to know about this valley. How did it, how did it, how did, it, uh, how did it become inside of the imagination of the Jewish people and ultimately inside of the mind and heart of Christ as he's speaking his parables and talking about hell? How did that become synonymous with what we would consider to be like punishment or judgment, right? Well, it actually has a pretty like infamous history. In fact, if you go back in the scriptures during the times of the kings, there were several kings who sacrificed their sons to the Canaanite god Moloch at, in that valley. They would spill the blood, human sacrifices in that valley. Now, if you go a little bit further, when Babylon sieged Jerusalem, you know what a siege is, right? Like, I don't have time to explain just how horrible a siege is, horrific a siege is. Dead bodies of Jews would be thrown into this valley, And so in the Hebrew prophets, in the Hebrew poets, this valley became synonymous with the day of judgment. Are you with me? And tradition also holds that during the time of Christ, it it was actually a garbage heap, a smoldering dump. You ever seen like people throw their garbage and burn it? Like this was kind of the space where that was taking place. Are you with me? And so with its infamous history and the reality of what it was during Jesus' time, right, right, we, we see a picture in the imaginations of the Jewish people of that final day of judgment where God would take everything that has invaded and ruined his good world, cast it out, throw it away, and burn it up. Are you okay? Now, and look, look at in Matthew 10, 28. And I say, look at it, but I only have it. Jesus said this. Jesus said this. Y'all remember? He says, do not fear the one who can kill the body and cannot kill the soul. Doesn't he say that? He says, but fear the one who can kill what? Both the body and cell in Gehenna. Wow. 
What's a, maybe another, another phrase or phrases uh, that Jesus uses with hell. He talks about outer darkness and everlasting fire, right? Some of you are like, yeah, that's the one I want to talk about. Now, can I tell you right away, we have to realize this is metaphor. This is imagery. Because you can't have darkness and fire in the same place. Are you with me? Because if something burns, it's not dark no more. So some of you are like, oh, phew. Right? As I was like, ah, oh, yeah, no, man, dodge that one. Ain't going to be full of fire, right? Well, well I want to I warn you that the imagery or the metaphor is often trying to describe something that we don't have human words for. And that usually what it's pointing to is uh, innumerably more intense than what's being worded. Are you with me? Okay. So can I talk about outer darkness for a second? It's a place where the light and radiance of God does not shine. Right? It's separation. In fact, uh, theologian R.C. Sproul, he said this, on one hand, it's the absence of God's presence. What does that mean? It's a place where all the benefits of God given to his creation are absent. It's still a little abstract, but think about that. It's a place where there is no grace. The grace of God. The mercy of God. And the blessings of God. Right, so on one hand, we could say that hell is the absence of God's presence. But R.C. Sproul goes on to say this, which I think is really important. On the other hand, it's the presence of God. And R.C. will say, it's not the absence of God we should be afraid of. <laughs> it's the presence of God. And what do we mean by God's presence? It's the presence of wrath. It's the presence of justice. Are you with me? So it's the absence of the good benefits of God and the presence of wrath and justice. Joshua Ryan Butler says the absence of light is kind of a reminder and possibly even an indication of a kind of return to a primordial chaos of Genesis 1, right? Before God said, let there be light, it was chaotic. And so we want to move from that to everlasting flame. I've been chewing on some incredible thoughts here um, throughout the week. You know, we tend to think fire as a mechanism of physical torture, right? Like burning at the stake. But fire is used in scripture to burn down idols. Did you know that? In fact, and, and Tim Keller says this, Jesus, Jesus tells a parable of a rich man and Lazarus. I don't know if you know that story, right? Lazarus was a, a beggar covered in sores. And he was on the rich man's front porch, essentially. And, and he would basically in life go ignored by this rich man who was a man of power, a man of prestige, a man of privilege, right? And they both die. And, and Jesus tells this parallel about one man, Lazarus. He says, Lazarus was taken to Abraham's bosom, right? This kind of place uh, 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 of eternal presence with God. And then uh, uh, um, the rich man was taken to Hades. And down there, the rich man is being tormented by the fire. Are you with me? Now, what's really interesting, Jesus doesn't give the rich man a name in the parable. Which is really weird because to name is to, to, to honor, to dignify. And so here we have the poor man who is dishonored and undignified on earth, now honored and given a name, Lazarus. And here we have the rich man who's been stripped of his identity and he's only called by what he pursued in his life. Are you, ser are you seeing what I'm seeing? So, so listen, listen, Jesus does not give the rich man a name. He only identifies him by what he loved. He only identifies him by what he pursued. He only identifies him by what he made his ultimate joy, his ultimate hope. This man put his pursuits and his joy in riches. Are you with me? And what does the fire do? The fire consumes. The fire crumbles until something disintegrates, until there's nothing left. Are you with me? Fire is not so much the mechanism of physical torture. The fire of God's judgment has burned down all that the rich man has lived for. Everything that he had invested his life in. 
all the shiny things that he had collected, all of the privilege that he enjoyed, all of the stuff that he had accumulated, the houses, the cars, the retirement, the bank account, the career, the title, the position, the power, the authority, all these things that he had accumulated in this world, all these things that he had prioritized, all these things that he had pursued over God, now in a moment were being utterly destroyed. Everything was being burned until there was nothing left but Jesus. This is why Jesus will often partner the weeping and gnashing of teeth. What is weeping? Weeping is a sign of turmoil. Weeping is a sign of sorrow. Weeping is a sign of profound grief. The rich man is in agony because all his idols... All his saviors, everything in life that he put first and pursued before God were consumed by the flame. And here's a bonus word that's used in there, torment. Torment refers to a touchstone that's used to test jewelry. And so when you take the the stone of torment and you rub it against the jewelry, what, what happens is it'll determine, it'll expose whether it was real or fake. And this man is being tormented. And what's being exposed is his true gods. And then you see gnashing of teeth, which again, we tend to think of physical pain. But when it's partnered with weeping, it is always referring to an intense hatred that is ever growing, ever increasing. As God consumes with fire everything they prioritize and worship in this life. This brings us to a fascinating point with God, with regards to God's justice and judgment. Tim Keller says, the image of hell is not of God throwing people into a pit and people like crawling, scratching to get out. No, hell is a place they want to be. And when I say I want to be, it's not you having a great time in hell. Hell is a place they freely chose to be. Hell is about God honoring our decision for a life and identity apart from him. Do you understand that? Like God doesn't just send you to hell. You choose to go to hell. You lived a life where you pursued saviors, where you prioritize everything else but God. And so when you go to hell, which will be torment, which will be outer darkness, which will be a kind of fire, all of that will be burned. Nothing but Christ will be left and you will be left to suffer in hatred as everything you passionately pursued is removed. And you'll be separated from God's presence. Not necessarily because God initiated that separation, but because you chose that separation in this life. It's what you chose. You see, when we place power, prestige, privilege, and wealth before God, it destroys us. When our ultimate drive in this life is a relationship, a career, a home, a title, a position, then we don't get those things. Or when we don't get those things, when those things are taken away from us, we'll become angry, bitter, jealous, competitive, envious, vengeful, hateful, even towards God. So hell becomes the ultimate manifestation of that, an eternity of weeping and gnashing of teeth. As your saviors are exposed for what they are, they're burned down. And there's a kind of eternal torment and emotional suffering and hatred that never ends because you're getting what you asked for. And I'm going to ask Dave to come up and there's an excerpt from C.S. Lewis, and it's a long excerpt, but I'm just going to read a short. In his book, The Great Divorce, listen to what he says. Look at what he says. He says this, in the long run, the answer to those who object to the doctrine of hell is itself a question. What are they asking God to do? To wipe out past sins and at all costs, give them a fresh start. But he did that on the cross to forgive them. But they don't ask for forgiveness. To leave them alone, that's what hell is. You see that? I'm going to read that again. 
In the long run, the answer to those who object to the doctrine of hell is itself a question. What are they asking God to do? To wipe out past sins and all, and all costs? Give them a fresh start? He did that on the cross. To forgive them? But they don't ask for forgiveness. To leave them alone? That's what hell is. There are only two kinds of people in the end. Those who God say, thy will be done. Those who say to God, thy will be done. And those to whom God says in the end, thy will be done. You see that? There are only two kinds of people in the end. Those who say to God, thy will be done. And those to whom God says, thy will be done. Are you with me? All that are in hell, choose it. Without that self-choice, it wouldn't be hell. Y'all with me? So again, this, there's a lot that can be said. But I, I, I want to make sure we frame hell. We put it in its proper place. And I know I promised four general views of hell, but I feel like in this moment, (laughs) I want to move away from that. And maybe just want to share from my heart and then we'll have the team get ready to come up. We'll just respond and then we'll pray. And so when you look at the cross of Jesus Christ, when you see God in the flesh, crucified on the cross. Like, why do we, why do we worship a suffering savior? Like, why are we, like, why does this feel like a blood religion? Well, it's because that blood that was spilt and that suffering on the cross was done in order to make all things new and to deal with all things that are wrong. And so what we see in Christ on the cross is him taking on the sin of the world and suffering hell. In fact, there's a moment on the cross where where the scripture says that he says, Father, Father, why have you forsaken me? There's a moment and kind of a picture that while the sin is, uh, Jesus was innocent, but our sin was placed on him, that we see almost the Father's presence. There's a moment in time where the Father's presence with the Son And I'm like, well, it's just a moment. I want you to know when you have been in eternity, the Trinity, eternally, and this is such a mystery. There's a moment in time, Jesus is suffering on his cross where he yells, God, Father, why have you forsaken me? Some of you think the cross was about the physical pain. But you cannot imagine, calculate or understand that moment of torment between the Father and the Son. Are you with me? And so why do we worship a suffering Savior? Why do we call Jesus Lord? And why do we lay down all our idols? You burn them or they'll burn you. Why do we lay them down at the feet of Jesus? Because on the cross, God himself made a way, justice prevailed, righteousness, newness, healing, heaven, earth, reconciled on that cross. So for all of those who would believe the story, who would put their faith, their trust, their hope in Christ Jesus would be saved. And Jesus would begin to deal with the hell, the power of hell that is both outside and inside so that he can make all things new again. This is what's going on. This is what's happening. On this side of the cross, the gospel is dealing with the hell. So with everybody just in a place of process, if you wanna close your eyes, you wanna bow your heads, if you wanna just keep your, it doesn't matter but I would like to just call you to accountability this morning in light of this truth. 
I don't know what point spoke to you. I don't know if, there, if you're overwhelmed with the tension of your idols and you're dealing with kind of right now, there's like a tug of war. I just pray that the love of Jesus, right, in this life would burn the idols, the pursuits, that you would see him as your ultimate treasure, your ultimate joy. And I don't know if you long for justice. I don't know if you're in this room and you have been deeply offended and sinned against and abused and tormented and hurt and, and you battle with vengeance and you battle, God, where is your justice? Would you even, would you even see that God has a plan? And would you even trust that justice is part of his nature, his character, is part of who he is? Come on, and just, I'm gonna pray, but just, I had this thought even before I came in today and I have this thought even now. And, uh, you know, I wanna, I wanna believe that it's the Holy Spirit leading me in this process. But, um, you know, I think it's painful for God to deal with your idols right now. Y'all hear me? Like that's painful for him to, when you gave your life to Jesus, for him to begin to put his hands on idols, for him, things of comfort and security and, and things of ambitious pursuit and identity, right? All these things and it's, it's painful when he wants to deal with these things, when he's asking you to crucify these things, when he's asking you to lay them down. But I wanna say he's worthy yeah. and, and, and he is, my greatest treasure. And this, this developing of this message has really like, man, if God were to burn everything down and all was left is Christ, would I be content? Everything that my hands have built, everything that I've put my identity in, everything that I feel like I'm confident in, like if he were to take it all away, would I like be angry? But would I be able to fall down and truly say, like, Christ, you are my treasure? And to be honest, there were moments and times where I, I didn't know. And, and this scared me a little bit as a pastor. And forget being a pastor, just as a person who's just wanting to follow Jesus. And I've just been wrestling internally. I know God's grace is sufficient. Yeah. And I know that he died on the cross even for my tensions and my doubts and my struggles. But it really just became almost a, a torment, right? A, a, an exposure, you know? To, to test the jewelry to see if it's real or if it's fake. Wow. Wow. I'll tell you what, like I sure desire for Jesus to be. I sure desire on that day as everything fades away that he would be my all. Yeah. Yeah. And I just want to say this, and, and, and maybe a team in the back, I know if we can go to this last, this last slide. On the cross, Jesus made a proposal. He says, I'll be the groom. You be the bride. We'll have a huge party. <laughs> and we'll celebrate and live in the kingdom forever. And those that accept this will enter into his rest. And those who say no to this proposal will go their own way to an eternity apart from him. And so my prayer inspired church is that you would continually say yes, yes to him. He is our treasure. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. It's so hard to even say thank you for judgment. <laughs> Thank you for justice. Thank you for love. And I pray as we leave this place that you would speak to us, Holy Spirit. I pray you'd burn idols down. I pray justice, that we would put our trust in the justice of God. You would deal with our sin, the powers of hell that are destroying our families and destroying our communities. You help us to be agents of the kingdom on earth, heaven on earth. Jesus taught us to pray. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Help us to kick hell out of earth. <laughs> help us to be a part of that. 
as your kingdom is coming. And so, Father, we're careful to give you all honor, all glory, and all praise. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. God bless you, Inspired Church. We love you so much. Have a wonderful Sunday. God bless.